Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Any uh, corrections, comments? If not, is there a motion to approve? So moved. Approve to approve. All right, and second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. All right. And moving along, public comments. Amy, any emails or comments you've received? No. No. All right, then on to the staff reports. During public comment, too, like if we get any emails or you know, anything that's kind of out there related to parks too that we've come in, I'll, I'll share them with the group too, but I haven't gotten anything. Okay. Oh, and hi, Chris. Glad you're here with us today. Okay. I'd see you. Yeah. All right, so on the staff reports, Amy, looks like you're up. Yeah, so, you know, across the recreation department, um, we'll kind of get into it with the discussion, but we're, we're starting to wrap up all of, as, much as our regular programming we can do outside and we're looking at shifting what we can indoors with mitigation and then there's some you know recreation that we can still do outside in the colder months so we're just um definitely getting ready for the halloween holiday um and all the events that go along with that um and then looking towards colder weather and what that entails this year with covid 19. Um, we are gearing up for the dog park opening. That's a, a, something we've been up to. Um, we are wrapping up, and Chris will talk about it later, the ice arena renovation project. Um, we also are closing out our playground builds that we did. Um, we I think, I know it's snowed today, but we still have a bench coming out to South Taft, the playground that was installed um, kind of across the street from the Home Depot. Um, there's still a bench that will get installed, but I think that's it. Um, there's a few remaining playground pieces to get installed at the one at Madison. I think there's a slide and a seat and that is coming on Thursday. So despite the snow, it should all still get installed before winter really takes a hold. Um, but so far, everyone in our department staying healthy and um, you just, Looking at the next season ahead. Nice. Mm -hmm. All right. And Amy, you're still up for discussion <laughs> items. Yeah. You know, kind of a standing uh, discussion item is COVID 19 and, and how it's affecting recreation. Um, and we are having to do a shift, and it's been challenging, you know, offering recreation. Um, since COVID started, but I think it's going to be increasingly challenged going into a colder season, especially as cases rise. Um, so we're really trying to stay on top of MDH guidelines and and what's going on. Um, but we are going to hopefully be making a shift indoors with some of our programming. Um, so I'm working really close with public health um, and our police chief to um, put a COVID-19 plan in place for every single program that we have, um, that we go through it together. Um, we look at it from different angles, see if there's things we need to change. And I think one kind of solid disclaimer with all the programming is at any point we need to um, cancel it. Um, you know, we definitely would do that in the coming months. Um, we wrapped up our park ambassador program, and that was initially really started um, responding to COVID-19 and doing some education in the parks this summer. And it really kind of turned into a lot more. Uh, we did do a lot of engagement with residents. Uh, we did a lot of light maintenance. Uh, we had really good communication with public works as to what, um, what things needed to be fixed or looked at. Um, we were also able to collect a lot of data this summer as to what parks are being used and how they're being used. So um, I have all those statistics I can send to people as to how many uh, people were contacted, the type of activity seen in parks, but that wrapped up this past Sunday. So we're gonna put a pause on the program in the colder months just because there's less people in parks. Um, but we do anticipate bringing it back next year 
in some capacity. It might not be as robust as it was this year, but it will, you know, we'll be doing it on some level. Um, yeah, I think the big thing though is just kind of the shift from outdoor recreation to indoors in the coming weeks here. Coming hours after all the snow today. <laughs> yeah. Sooner than you planned. Yeah, exactly. And then I'm up next with the dog park update. Um, you know, we were anticipating to open the dog park in October and we had a delay really because of COVID-19. The company we've been working with to do the fabrication of the large signs, um, everything's just kind of back ordered. Um, the fabrication and production of it. Uh, but in talking with them today, we should have it in the next week. So we are tentatively scheduling our ribbing, ribbing cutting for the dog park November 5th. It's a Thursday. Uh, so it would be 4.30 p.m. And I'll invite our commission and, of course, our council and our mayor um, and anybody else who would like to come. Uh, I'm working with some uh, local business owners to put together a little bags of dog treats. So if the first, I think it's like 25 dogs that come, we'll get a little bag of treats. Uh, but it's, as we put it together, I, I'm getting more and more excited about the dog park. I think people are really going to enjoy it. Um, some of the things when you come, you'll get to see is there's definitely some nice open areas for dogs to run. There's a separate small dog park, big dog park. Um, we have some accessible picnic tables. There's an area of shade trees. And we also did some tree planting a week ago. So there's some new trees that went in. There's a couple hydrants um, that dogs will like. We have some grooming tables. There's a photo booth that's really cute. Um, so it, it's starting to come together. I, I think the community be, will be really excited. We had to lighting and some accessibility with parking. Um, so that's, it's been nice to have actually a few more weeks to put it all together because Public Works has been pretty busy. But look for an email from me probably sometime by the end of this week about the, the ribbon cutting on November 5th. All right, and Amy, you're still up. <laughs> I'm still up. Uh, just to remind everyone, we do have our active youth grant from Hennepin County, and we got a little over $100,000 for activities to keep youth engaged and moving, and we've been able to spend it across the department in lots of different ways. Uh, we have to have it spent down by the end of December, so I'm working with staff to make sure all the proposals we initially put in at the beginning of the summer, um, we are you know, following through with everything and making sure things get ordered. Um, but every area of the department has been able to offer programming, buy equipment, offer free programming. Um, so it's been a really wonderful um, opportunity for us. And there may be some money on the back end, we'll know soon, um, that we can put in additional proposals in for that we'll be able to keep offering programming to keep youth active. So, but, cool. Mm -hmm. And then fall winter recreation programming, we're continuing kind of our three prong approach where we will have some um, in person programming with mitigation. Every program will have a COVID plan. We have our some virtual programs, and then we also have some self guided. Um, and right now, we're doing quite a bit for Halloween this week and next week. Um, Next Friday and Saturday, we'll get it out there if people want to spread the word. We're doing a virtual dance party, a Halloween dance party. Um, we hired a DJ that put together a Halloween program for kids. And then we're also going to put it on cable access on Friday and Saturday night. So it's kind of a safe way we figure if kids don't have the opportunity to go trick-or-treating or they're not participating, um, they can throw a costume on or not a costume and just dance. It's a lot of fun. Uh, we have like a scavenger hunt coming up next week. We have uh, Wood Lakes Halloween is this Saturday, um, this Saturday afternoon. It'll be interesting to see what goes on with the snow. And if we are 
outside in the snow off to see. Uh, but there's quite a few activities planned, so I'm excited about that. We have virtual costume contests, virtual pumpkin carving contests. Uh, we're also working on planning the farmer's market. So the last farmer's market of the season ended this past Saturday. And then our first one of the winter season starts November 7. And that's going to be inside the community center with quite a bit of mitigation and a limited number of people allowed in at a time. Um, but we'll have it every Saturday, I think, through mid-December. And then it's once a month, January, February, and March. So that's um, coming up. Uh, we have programming at the arena, kind of as we usually do, with just mitigation. Uh, Wood Lake has definitely been impacted quite a bit with COVID as there's less opportunities for students to go on field trips. So now that the school year is starting to settle, maybe just a little bit, we are getting more requests for groups. Um, we've had like Blessed Trinity walkover. We've even had some uh, Holy Angel students walk over for programming. Uh, we are able to go to schools, so that's something we're looking at potentially going to schools and doing some outdoor programming this winter. But they've been doing a lot of resource management um, with a couple grants that we have. The past few weeks, they planted over 300 shrubs, I think like 20 some trees, and then they hosted the Conservation Corps and they were out working on a grant in the prairie last week. So lots of resource management. So it's also been nice to have this time to do more work outside. And then the community center, we are offering um, a senior drive-through program. It's coming up, it's October 27th. And it's kind of like a resource fair. Sorry, yeah, it's the 27th from 1 to 3. So seniors can come and drive through the parking lot. And we'll have multiple stations set up where they can um, get kind of like goodie bags with resources and items for their bags. Um, and we'll be able to communicate with them about potential programming that we'll be able to offer. Um, so we're, we're still staying quite busy and doing you know as much as we can. In light of COVID. Okay. Sounds good. Mm -hmm. Amy, I have a quick question Chris. for you. Oh. Mm -hmm. With some of the programming you've been working on, how's participation been? It's been really good. Uh, pretty much all of our programs are full. Um, we have, I mean, like our would like Halloween sold out in two days. Um, I think all of our fitness classes are full. Our parent child classes are full. We started kind of an after school program at Wood Lake for kids to come after school and it's outdoors. So they do different activities for a few hours. That's been growing. It kind of started with six kids. I think they can take up to 10. So there's probably room each day of the week for a few more kids. Um, but most all the other classes have been really full and i know chris can speak to it but we've had a pretty high demand for ice time as well and like public skates been quite busy That's a good thing any other questions all right chris your turn okay there we go yeah so uh, uh like amy said our we have been unbelievably busy a lot because there's people that are a lot more free during the day. So we've been running ice during the day, which has been great. Our public skate has been busy. Our stick and puck's been busy. We actually added another session because it's been so busy. So I guess one of the positives of COVID, there's people getting, being wanting to be more active during the day, which is great. Um, great that we can accommodate them in that regard. Uh, in terms of the project, I, I'll break it down into five parts. We have the refrigeration project, our roof project, our ADA project, our HVAC project, and then the building management system that wraps it all together. Um, our refrigeration project is basically done. It has one punch list item left on it, and it should be done uh, this week. 
uh, everything's going really well. Uh, all the feedback we've been getting in terms of our ice quality um, and just the building itself, we're gonna get a lot of feedback on it and the system is running really well. Uh, hopefully we'll be able to dial in once our building management system's all running, uh, dial in the energy and give how much we're saving in energy and chemical and our maintenance. It'll take a few months for that to dial in to get that all done. Um, in terms of the rough project, I don't know if, if anybody's seen the front of the building. Um, the main main rough in the front and the main rough in the back got done. Um, they're just waiting to put the metal wrap on. Uh, that'll really help with the aesthetics. Uh, we've got some new signage that'll be put up in the next couple of weeks as well. That's supposed to be done by end of October. So hopefully this weather uh, can turn around for us so we can get that done. Um, the HVAC starts the second week in November. It's about a week long process to get that done. So we'll have be able to dehumidify in rank one and then help save energy as well for next summer. Um, that'll be a key piece to saving energy. Looking forward to that being done. And then the ADA bathrooms are getting worked on as we speak. Um, and that should be done in two weeks. So we're looking forward to that, to being ADA accessible in both our main restrooms within the building. Uh, all in all, the project's going really well. Uh, can't wait to get it done here. Hopefully, I think all the pieces will be done by the middle of November. That's what we're looking at. And then at that point, we'll be giving some uh, tours. Cool. Any questions for Chris? All right, thanks, Chris. Welcome. And to our commission presentation to council. Yeah, I thought, Lisa, if you could just um, let everybody know what that entails if they're new to the commission and um, what night we are going to do it. And all right, so let me let you see what night am I doing this? Um, I think you have the 10th, I want to say. The 10th? Yeah. Yes, there it is. Yeah, November 10th. So what that entails is I, uh, well, I usually go to the council meeting. This time I'll join like this and kind of give them a quick run rundown of what we've done over the past year. Give an update of uh, various projects and discussions, that sort of thing. Perfect. Yeah. So if anyone from the commission wants to come, I mean, you can come to council meetings any night um, you'd like, but if you'd like to come on the tent, um, they'll probably be towards the beginning of the agenda. Um, and we'll work with um, each commission to put together probably a few slides as well. Okay. Mm -hmm. Sounds good. Yeah. Right. So on to our action items we actually have some this month <laughs> yeah um, our first one uh chris and i have the um, pleasure of working with our honoring all veterans memorial group um we often refer to them as have them the acronym um mm -hmm. but as i'm sure a lot of you know they're um the group of residents and citizens and quite a few more veterans that work towards raising awareness um and funds and support for the memorial. And in meeting with them, um, they were wondering if anyone on our community services commission would be interesting, would interested in serving as a liaison to um, their organization. They meet once a month. Um, that's usually at 5.30 in the evening. And um, I think next year they're gonna be focusing their energy um, around a theme that we're developing. And we're looking at doing a big fundraiser probably towards the fall. Um, but they often put together, uh, you know, a Veterans Day ce celebration or service coming up. It's November 11, and then they'll do something on Memorial Day as well. Um, so those are kind of two big events that they put on. And then they do some fundraising as well. So, um, but they're a really nice group of people to work with. Um, so I told them we would put it out there to our group and see if anyone would be interested. 
and that would function just like any of our other liaison appointments. Yeah, report yeah. back to the group uh, and what that group was discussing or working on. Mm -hmm. uh, anybody interested in taking that on? Okay. Going all volunteer at once. Do you know what day they meet? Um, it's typically, I believe, is it Chris the first Thursday of the month? Yep, first Thursday of the month. Mm -hmm. Five thirty can be a little problematic as a time, but I can do some looking. Yeah. If people want to think about it too, could always email Chris or I. Um, and I, they've been meeting in person and um, with lawn chairs, kind of socially distanced out at the memorial. But I think going into the winter, they'll it'll be a virtual format. Do they post minutes as well so that if need be, someone could at least report back to us that aren't able to attend? Yeah, they do. Yeah, they um, they take minutes and they email them out to the group. Okay. So that may be a, a short term option for us. Someone is willing to take on that role, even if you're unable to attend the meetings. Let's get us a connection. Several yeah, years ago, when you. Reed was the chair of our commission, um, he acted as that liaison because he was on that. He worked with that group too. So he was just there yeah. and reported back. Um, we haven't had that connection since he left. So it'd be nice to get that. Uh, he's the secretary now. So he actually takes the minutes. Okay. Yep. Yeah, if, if people are unsure and if you have questions, you can ask Chris or I, um, and maybe just reach out to us if uh, you're interested. I know they could use some help. I think they're, you know, they're really trying to get some energy around um, fundraising and the, the year ahead. So if, um, you know, people would like to be a part of it, just let us know. Okay. All right. And on to uh, amending our CIP budget. Yes. Um, so we've had two things kind of bubble up the last month or so. Um, one of them um, really, you know, we, we didn't know it was going to happen. The other one um, is kind of an opportunity. Um, so I wanted Chris to come not only to give us the arena update, but also the pool maintenance because from not having the pool open this summer, you know, we incurred some some damage to the pool um, that really needs to be looked at before it can reopen next summer. So I'm going to just have Chris kind of explain what's going on with the, the pool. Yeah, as you um, as you can imagine, when things when you're not using things, that's when things break down. It actually happened a lot at the arena while we were down for four or five months with not, with pumps and motors and all that kind of stuff. And you turn them back on again and they're not working or they're leaking or whatever the case may be. Uh, it's the same kind of scenario with the pool. Um, our main container in the large pool suffered a fair amount of damage. Um, we think it's gonna be fixable obviously, but um, when we didn't have water in there in July and August, the two hot, hottest months, it kind of acted like a highway would with a, like a little bit of buckling in some areas. Yeah, so not good. Uh, it's not as bad as we thought, but we are actually able to, I got someone up there and they saw cut it this week and poured concrete right before the snow slide. So we fixed that problem, but it's still where, you know, it's going to be costly. The whole thing is going to need to be repainted, um, all the lines for the lane lines, all that kind of stuff, just so we make sure that we take care of that container correctly. That container, I think some of you were there when I gave the tour a long, long time ago. That container was built in 1961, so we have to baby that thing every year, and this year it took on more damage than we usually have um, throughout the winter with uh, freezing and thawing. So. With that being said, we know that there's at least thirty to thirty-five thousand dollars of damage that we need to fix when it comes to painting concrete, 
stock cutting, those kinds of things. So we have to be prepared for that in our CIP budget for next year. What about mechanicals there when you turn those pumps back on? That's they're not the, being used for a year. You know, we, we've done what we can in the off season right now where we still spin them and we're oiling them. Um, you know, we can, we'll quickly turn the power on them just to get the uh, moving again so they don't completely fall apart. Um, we've done that twice this summer, and then we'll do it again in the spring prior to starting up. So we're hopeful that that's not going to be an issue, but I can't say that we're not going to have some pump or motor that's not going to be down. I, I would anticipate we'd at least have one. Is there funding available for that possibility? For, for those pumps and motors? Yeah. The good thing is our, our pool budget is usually fairly uh, done well um, just because of how big an operation it is from year to year. Uh, for example, this year we bought, you know, we're always buying furniture, pool deck furniture all the time uh, every year. Well, I just prior to the spring in March, we purchased a whole bunch and then we didn't open. So that's something that we don't have to purchase next year because we have enough. So we're looking at that ten to fifteen thousand dollars worth of pump and motor that could happen. So okay. How much so do there's... you have in the budget for babying that container? What was that? Well, he says we always have to baby the container. So how much do we usually put aside for that? And how much of a difference will this be? Oh, mm -hmm. yeah, great question. Um, uh, typically year I'll spend five to $7,000 repairing the container. Okay. So this is a lot more with the painting. Yeah. Um, so our thoughts with the pool and where we can find the 35,000, um, we, every year, you know, with the, with the commission, we approve, um, community center and wood lake building repair money. Mm -hmm. Because neither building has been open, um, we really haven't spent a lot of money out of that budget at all. Um, so there's, when we don't spend money out of CIP, it doesn't go away. It still sits there. So we're going to have probably over half of the 35000 left um, in that budget we can use for the repairs on the pool. And then next year, um, we will have to, again, probably just spend less at Wood Lake and the community center. And I think that's a way we can get the pool done and do some maintenance at each site. Um, but yeah, we have hardly spent really anything with both buildings closed to the public most of the year. So um, I have a question about Wood Lake then because, and correct me if I'm wrong, my memory is terrible, but I, I think that months back when we weren't worrying and dealing with COVID, Wood Lake was kind of on the docket for possible updates. And maybe that was further in the future, but is that something that we're just not thinking about or... No, Wood Lake, um, you know, we took it to the legislature this year. We wrote a bill that um, it okay. was a brand new bill that was introduced. It got a lot of exposure and interest. Um, it wasn't on this year's bonding bill, but it's something we'll be bringing back again. Um, okay. A lot of times that kind of thing will take two, three rounds before it gets approved. But it was a bonding bill. Um, to get the project shovel ready, but Wood Lake would be a complete teardown and rebuild. Okay. I mean, I could talk for hours probably with all the problems with that building. I mean, it's fine for right now, um, but long term, it definitely needs to be replaced. Mm -hmm. um, and yes, we, we are talking about, I think because of the aquatics, um, in general, we will need a new liner. I know David had a question, long-term plan. Um, you know, we're starting to have those conversations. What does like an aquatics improvement package look like? Because I know one of the desires of the community was, we've heard is a splash pad. Um, we talked about a new container for the pool. 
um, you know, there may be some opportunities to to reconfigure that space over by the Legion, kind of where the trees are to do something a little different or add on. Um, so we're actually at a good place with it. We know down the line it needs to be replaced. Um, we might see kind of what de what gets developed um, in and around that Legion space. Um, you know, if we're able to expand, if we need to stay where we're at. Um, but I think we'll know in the coming year, like what 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 that space may be down the line. Um, but it may need to be a referendum. It may need to be a bonding bill. Um, you know, aquatics cost a lot of money, and it might be something that we package with another rec item that could be an option too, like a new nature center or community center complete renovation or something like that. Um, but it's a big enough thing. I don't know if we can pay for it with just the little bit of CIP money we have every year and plus do everything else that has to get done. Right. It would take so long. I think it needs to be, you know, a, a chunk of money that we that we get. So I think, uh, you know, we're bringing it to people's attention that it's something not too far down the line that needs to be addressed. How we do it right now, I don't think we know, but we'll we'll be on it. And to to follow up with David, your other question on the ground study, mm -hmm. you know, I don't know that there's been a ground study there. There's probably been a soils study where we've done uh, soil samples, but we haven't done a ground study. You know, this the damage that had happened over the last year was literally because we didn't have the water in the pool, and that white concrete gets so hot sun baking on it, that that's why that did what it did. So in a typical year, you wouldn't have that much damage. I was curious, in the event that we have a repeat this year, would it make sense to put water in the pool? Does it cost more to fill it and run the pumps and keep it running if we're not using it? Do you want me to answer that, Amy? Or <laughs> yeah, I, mean, I don't think we're anticipating that will happen. Um, we had to make the decision when we did to not open the pool um, with the information that we had about right. COVID at the time and hiring. Uh, I think, you know, communities that, that were able to get that amount of staff very quickly towards the second half of summer were able to open safely with COVID. Um, so I'm hopeful knowing what we've learned so far about COVID, we would be able to open with mitigation for next year. Um, but as far as leaving water in the pool, I don't know, what, what's your opinion? Well, you know, I'll go back to the staffing part two. Um, if we're not able to open again, that would really put us behind the eight ball in terms of staffing it. You know, every year it's a struggle to get lifeguards, cashiers, concessions there. If we're set back another year, that would really put us back. Um, so it's, uh, I think it's in our best interest to try to be open and mitigate as much as possible, um, yeah. especially just for staffing. Because um, we want we, we want these kids working in the in the city as well. There, there was a lot of kids that didn't have jobs this summer because we weren't open. Um, so it's important to me to keep that relationship with those those kids going. So in terms of putting water in it, um, you know, I don't know that that would pay off if we're not open. Um, <laughs> But I, I really hope that we are. St. Louis Park was able to open their doors and they were able to hold under the 250 threshold for capacity. And we're going to follow their lead as best, as best we can, depending on how this, obviously, there's a lot of unknowns in the next uh, six months. But I'm, that's our plan is to try to op be open for next year. Cool. Yeah. The other CIP item is um, resurfacing the parking lot at Veterans Park. Um, and in spending so much time around the parking lot because of the farmer's market, um, you know, we have quite a few potholes, the curving's kind of falling apart there. It's really a, a keystone, that pavilion to our whole park system. Um, it's been really vital this summer for the market and for people to gather under there. And it's it's been tough having it in such um, you know disrepair. We've had to call an ambulance three times for people falling at the farmers market. 
Um, so I feel like it would be uh, in our best interest to resurface next summer. And Public Works is doing a, a larger mill and overlay project. And so we can attach this parking lot project with that and we would get a much better rate um, for the work than if we did it as its own project in a different year. So I think it's something that needs to be done sooner than later. And you know, like after seeing people fall and, and seriously get hurt, I would prefer to do it next year. It comes at a price tag of $125,000. Um, so in looking at uh, the original budget we approved, you know, we had kind of 2001A if we got the grant for the inclusive playground and 2001B if we didn't get the DNR grant. Um, and we did get the DNR grant, so we can kind of adopt the, the 2021 budget A um, but we're having to kind of shift things around. Um, so instead of doing um, one tennis court, we're going to do uh, the Madison tennis court, which was half the money as the other one that was on there, uh, the Fairwood tennis court. So we're able to do one less playground. Um, you know, it's not fun having to take that off but I feel like it would be almost negligent to, to not do the parking lot. So. I did get a report from the city manager today that um, they are hopeful in the coming year to increase our CIP budget, which would be awesome. So that will be helpful too if we see that increase. What would the timing be of the, the parking lot resurfacing? Could it be before the farmer's market starts in the spring? It would have to be kind of when the mill and overlay project goes. And I don't know exactly when that's scheduled, um, but we can do it in, in the middle of the week and in a day. The part oh, okay. it doesn't need to take up the weekend or a whole week or anything. Okay. Yeah. All right. Any other questions from anyone? I guess I'll, I'll answer Heather's question that she had about the Christmas tree lot. Um, right now we are planning for them to be open and selling Christmas trees, uh, but we still have to go through uh, public safety on that to get the approval. Yeah, I know there were other kind of festivities last year as well. Like uh, I think there was like horse and carriages and, and some other things too. So that kind of just was, was another question because I know, you know, that parking lot well, and I know, we all know what potlucks or sorry but well, we do all know what potlucks are but um <laughs> but you know we all know what our roads can be like and and everything in the winter as well so that just kind of um came to mind with that thank you any other questions or comments Are there any way that we can revamp some of those costs from the farmer's market by either expanding it or doing something unique? You know, just like you mentioned, like horse carriage rides or, you know, um, expanding the vendors or upcharging them a little bit. Are those possibilities? Yeah, you know, I do think next year will will be a really good year for shelter rentals. Um, hopefully, we're a little bit different stage with COVID. Um, this year, we we weren't able to really rent the shelter out, out at all because of the farmers market mitigation. Um, you know, the going rate for our vendors is kind of consistent with the other farmers markets. Um, we don't want to raise it too much because they're you know really not. In, making a lot of money off of of being a vendor at the farmers market so we want to you know have a fair price um but yeah i think down the line um is there anything that we can do with the band shell to get some revenue for the parking lot yeah i mean in general that we'll be able to do a lot more kind of after covid i felt working with public health they, 
we weren't really able to utilize the band shell because it's it's really hard to control numbers at a venue like that. Um, but down the line, I definitely think you know we have ideas to to have events that will generate more revenue there. Yeah, I think there's a lot of potential at the band shell. Yeah, for sure. Amy, is the 2022, um, the numbers don't add up to 450, um, the Donaldson Park renovation hold, is that, yeah. I mean, because uh, I was looking at the amount that was in the old version of the CFP for Donaldson Playground for both 2022 and 2023, um, and that was 460, what's there now across those three line items is 490. Mm -hmm. um, is that Donaldson Park renovation hold? Um, is that higher than it needs to be for, for a, for, or I mean, it, not that the numbers have to match up. I mean, especially if the amount that we're getting goes up. But yeah, um, no, it was just it, it doesn't. It it can definitely go back down to four fifty. It was just if any money we have extra, I wanted to hold it and not spend it for a specific project, so we'd have more for the renovation. Right. It's going to basically eat up um you know multiple years of CIP to rework Donaldson Park, that building, the playground, mm -hmm. uh, some of the fields. And so really, you know, it's, it's kind of like the pool. Any year we have a little leftover, you know, we definitely have no shortage of projects to put it to. But I think knowing we have to do Donaldson in the coming years as well. Um I, I mean I'm Fairly confident our budget will go up either to 500 or 550 in the coming year. And so anything extra, um, we should probably put towards Donaldson though. But yeah, you're right. I don't think it does add up, right? Sorry about mm -hmm. that. Yeah, if it was 15, it'd be correct. And because then if, it, if our total budget does go up, then all of that could also be added to that hold. Yeah. Next year. I mean, assuming nothing else comes out of the boardwork. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I think for, you know, for this evening, the most important thing is really approving next year and what we can do with the money next year. All right, is there a motion to approve? So moved. Second. And second. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right, motion carries. Good. Because there are two projects well worth the expenditure. All right. So moving on to our committee reports. Transportation, Kevin. I was not able to go to the, the meeting. The minutes are not yet, but the, the main item on the agenda for the last meeting was 65th Street. So if you haven't gone on 65th behind the hub, they've got it all torn up and down to one lane each direction. Um, so they're talking about trail width, Wendy's access, um, what to put in the median. They're doing a kind of a planted median down the road. Um, what to do at Pillsbury intersection and what about the Richfield Lakes trail entrance? I'll have more information next time. Okay. Uh, foul board. Stephanie with us? No. I went to the fall board meeting last week. Um, and you know, they're already starting to talk about the dinner. Um, there are some of the uh, fall board is helping out with Halloween on Saturday. So there's a little bit of talking about, um, just what's coming up at Wood Lake and then looking ahead. Um, next year is their 50 year anniversary. Um, so we are kind of putting together a committee. Uh, we're meeting about it on Monday, Paul and I, um, putting together a small group of people to kind of plan some special events around the 50 year birthday of Wood Lake next year. Um, but they are hopeful to get Will Steger to come to the dinner and be a speaker. Cool. Mm -hmm. I think I saw him when I was in third grade. <laughs> Will <laughs> Steger. <laughs> Um, do 
So I know that we do the equipment rentals, and that's shutting down what on like the twenty eighth or something. Yep. Um. Do we have any coagulation with like the school board? Um, to do like cross country ski rentals for Wood Lake or something? Because when I was growing up, um, my mother was a school teacher and we were able to get that for no cost. Um, have we explored anything like that? Yeah, so we do have, you know, cross country skiing and snowshoeing at Wood Lake. Um, and I think it's all of our fifth graders come and learn to ski. Um, you know, it's challenging this year just with COVID and buses. I'm not sure, but it is something, you know, we can explore bringing snowshoes to the school and teaching snowshoes showing at the school potentially this winter. Um, but it is something we offer um, for multiple grades when they come out for the free field trips. And then with the equipment rental, um, you know, the 27th being or 28th being the last day, I think we're going to try to pause it and then look at getting some winter recreation and no equipment that residents can check out, such as snowshoes, um, things like that. So hopefully we'll have some winter gear that we can get with the grant money and people can utilize that. That was a great program, by the way. Or it's a great program. Checking yes. on equipment. That was mm -hmm. fun. Right, uh, planning. Thanks, Lisa. In the planning commission, there were two main items of interest on the agenda. Um, the first one was a variance to a driveway that was built without a permit that was oversized. Um, the second item was um, approving an amendment to a mixed use development uh, at the intersection of 66th and 1st or 66th and Stevens. And the amendment is for the, the, the complex going in as part apartment complex and part commercial use. And they want to add more units than they had origin, originally presented. And there was a number of comments from the neighborhood around there of mixed, mixed reviews. But that, those were the main items at the Planning Commission. All right. Thank you, David. Uh, Arts Commission. Art. You're muted. We can't hear you, Art. Nope. Art, try the audio and video settings on the upper left corner of your window. Maybe the drop down that says audio and video on the your top bar file edit share view. Click audio video and then speaker and microphone settings. See if you just have to change your microphone. Um, I don't have anything to report, so. Lisa, you're muted. Thank you. All right, thanks, Art. Uh, Amy, Friendship City, anything from them? Not a whole lot. They did meet, they're only meeting quarterly, um, but you know, they're having because of COVID to cancel their trip next year. They're not able to do the a lot of the events because they've been canceled. So, um, or just like a quarterly check in is what they're they've been doing, but not a whole lot. Okay. Sustainability, Heather. Uh, not a ton to report. Um, they're still working on the climate action plan. That's really the main, you know, the main thing that they're trying to. To get finished, which is a pretty hefty document. So it's, you know, going through some rounds of 
edits and questions and and um, updates and things like that. Um, so I believe now it is still being going through a few kind of more final updates. Um, one, really, the only other thing I can think to mention that I've that I see in my notes is the 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 tree in the Lunds and Byerly's parking lot, which now has been torn down, but it was you know something that a lot of community members were really passionate about and. And so the, the committee kind of picked up on that and had planned to draft an open letter on that. I don't know what the status is, but I'll find out on Thursday uh, when their meeting happens, if if they ever did, you know, get the letter out and receive anything. Um, I will say I, I, I'm pretty sure that once that tree was cut down, it was dead inside. It was quite large. So, um, you know, I, we don't need to go into my opinion on all of it, but um, but yeah. So so there was a a good discussion on that. So um, and that's really all that I can think of at this point. Like I said, that community action plan is really just it, it's really their main goal right now. It's looking really good in my opinion. I know Amy, you've seen and probably worked on quite a bit of it. Um. But um, but that's really going to be a big part of you know how the city becomes more sustainable, and um, you know how we kind of can regulate certain things and and plan for for improving in that arena. So so it's a, a pretty pretty big deal. Hey, thanks, Heather. All right, we've reached the end. Any other questions or comments from the group? I know um, the tree is kind of a big issue at Lunds Byerly's, and Council's been getting a lot of emails and letters. Um, so myself and Director Stark and Community Development um, and Sustainability Specialist uh, Rachel and Holm, we're going to be meeting um, and just looking at tree preservation policies in the climate action plan um, there is some um, action steps in, in preserving legacy trees but we don't have a super robust tree preservation plan um, as other communities do so it's something that we uh, the sustainability commission and the planning commission may come together and, and draft a policy um, that may have some specific um, you know, wordage and policy around private property and public property um, and what we can and can't do with each. There are things we can suggest for private property, such as Lens Fire Lease, but, um, you know, there's different legal ramifications when it's uh, private property. So. so, Amy, can I ask, did you, do you know, um, and and I mean it's extremely possible that you don't because you don't work for Lunds and Buyer Lease. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm just wondering if there were tests or anything done to check on the health of the tree or anything like that before that was torn down. Um, maybe yeah, maybe I'll find out Thursday. But yeah, they had uh, you know like an arborist they had been working with for years and preserving and protecting those trees. I think they were kind of a, a family favorite of theirs and they were spending over $8,000 a year in their protection. Um, but, you know, as you saw when it was cut down, a lot of it was starting to die from the inside out. And frankly, it probably could have stood many more years, um, but it wasn't an overly healthy tree. Um, right. Um, but I don't think it's something they necessarily wanted to seek out, but I think it wasn't healthy. And um, with the development that they had planned, it made the most sense for it to go. Mm -hmm. but, and the city only had, I mean, with private property, you only have so much you can, can do sometimes with that. So. Is that something that the, the plan would, you know, consider 
sorry, I know it's the last couple of minutes here, but is that something that, you know, the plan would consider possibly, you know, new owners of land having different rules? Is that a possibility or something that's being considered? Or even I possible? Like, I think we're we're kind of just starting looking at tree preservation policies. A lot of the policies we're seeing in one that's kind of a best practice in Richfield, if a tree does need to be cut down for any odd reason, that a tree's planted to replace it. And that's pretty consistent what we do in parks. Like if um, you know, if we have Dutch elm trees or emerald ash borer trees that come down, you know, we usually will plant multiple trees in replacement of it. Um, that's a common thing. Another thing as um, what do you call it? Proposals come through the Council Planning Commission. You know, it's another thing that we can be checking for and vetting for and looking at proposals for development or redevelopment. And if trees are coming down, if they need to come down, if they can be, they do, can they be replaced? What is the new tree plan if they, they are cut down? Um, so we're, you know, we really haven't formally met about it, but I think it, it is something that, that we'll move towards. I think I'll probably have more of an update next month um, for everyone. Thank you. Yeah, cool. of course. Any other questions or comments? Yeah, I, I'm just intrigued uh, and interested in what the building is going up in front of the old champs. Okay. It's chase. A, it's a chase bank? Yep. yep. Okay. Anything else? All right, then I will see all of you again. Tuesday, November 17th.